Hi, I'm Bill Mays. I'm going to read to you from my book, George, The Early Years. It is the first book in a trilogy. The, uh, the books came out out of sequence. The uh, second book, George, The Lost Year, is already available, and then this one will come out in about a month, and then in 2021, I'll bring them both out as audiobooks. George, The Early Years is a coming-of-age story. It's a Romeo and Juliet story. It's about a young man who grows up in a family of Greek mobsters, hence the, uh, the Greek fisherman's cap. So, George, the early years. George stared at the pretty girl at the next picnic table. She sat with her family, all of them blonde and perfect, the men in starched jeans and boots, the women in western skirts. In contrast, he sat with his family, 11 Greeks, enough for a football team. They all wore their ethnic uniforms, floral dresses for the women, khaki work pants for the men. The only variation was one eye, his great-grandmother who always dressed in black. The girl started staring back. He tried not to get excited, assuming she was looking at something behind or beyond, and he only thought she was staring at him. That was how life worked. You got all stirred up by the proximity of all that beauty and interpreted events from your own pathetic bias and escalated from staring to gawking to outright ogling only to realize he was looking at the big strapping high school fullback who happened to be standing behind you. There was no one else around though. She laughed like she knew what he was thinking. A breeze gusted off the bay and rippled through her hair, which was wild and free, not like the coiffed helmet hair of the other women at her table. She wasn't dressed like the others either. She wore faded jeans and a white muslin cotton blouse that rustled in the breeze along with her hair. She looked like a hippie. He sat fused between Mother and Uncle Nick. The Holy Trinity they were. Nick checked his Rolex and Mother checked her Lady Seiko. While the white people had better clothes, the Greeks had better watches. <laughs> Nick swapped marijuana for them, and everyone had a good one, even one eye, who could barely see and was too senile to tell time. George looked at his, a fancy Timex chronograph with dials, a stopwatch, and a display of the phases of the moon. It was almost time to meet the courier, so he ratcheted up the flirtation, leaning toward the girl and smiling really big. She smiled, too. Mother noticed the drama and raised an eyebrow. When Nick saw what was happening, he shuddered. In their pantheon, skinny blondes were right up there with demons, and they did not want George tempted. He, the one with the precocious vocabulary, would be needed in the inevitable battle with their sworn enemy, Lazarus. Bold action was necessary if he were to get her phone number. Rising from the cement bench, extricating himself from the suffocating embrace of family, he unfurled himself to his full five foot seven inches and fixed a manly, steely gaze on her. She looked him up and down with great interest, it seemed. He would stroll over nonchalantly and introduce himself. What are you doing, Nick asked. Going where the wild geese fly, he announced in a voice loud enough for everyone at both tables to hear. I have no wings and no inner compass to guide me on cross-country migration, but I have determination and free will. Nick Smallboro bobbed up and down in his mouth as he talked. Confusion etched into his face. What? It was like the ancient times, and he was a toga-clad thespian, delivering lines at the theater of Dionysus, or mixing his literary illusions. Romeo below Juliet's window, to slip the surly bonds of earth and dance the skies on laughter-silvered wings. What in the hell are you talking about? That last line is from the sign-off on TV every night. It's, it's a poem. What are you doing staying up late? He decided that he was making a fool of himself and started to sit. But the girl stood too. Everyone at both tables froze, mouths in mid-chew, forks in mid-air. It looked like a tableau on the Parthenon. Only one eye didn't know what was happening. Her empty socket, permanently shut from glaucoma surgery, faced the girl, so she didn't see a thing, and she kept yakking in Greek about some dispute over olive groves back in her village when she was a girl. Finally, even she realized there was a problem, and she turned and focused her good eye on George and then at the temptress. When she realized the girl was a Xenia, a stranger, her mouth dropped open in shock.